I have to say Limits to Growth was one of the probably two seminal epiphany creating books that I read in my journey after I left Wall Street. Most people that work on Wall Street have never heard of the book, much less read it. And if they have heard of it, they've heard of it as some neo-Malthusian nonsense that you can ignore. But it, it was, a, to paraphrase Ray Anderson, it was a spear in the chest for me. It was a holy shit moment. Because if exponential growth doesn't work, then everything I thought was true is built on a foundation of sand. And, uh, and it's pretty self-evident if you read, certainly the, I mean, it sounds like you got a summary of a more, me- more recent research where an Australian academic went back and documented the pathway, which is all you need to know. It's stunning. The other thing I would say just before to continue with the, the sort of let's get ourselves all bummed out moment before we try to find our way out of the hole. If you really want to get depressed, Thomas, you should have added a session on the biodiversity crisis and the, the sixth great extinction. And I'm not going to talk about it, but I'll simply make the point that if we could magically invent free energy free, clean energy for everyone distributed in unlimited supply on the entire planet, there's no doubt in my mind we would destroy ourselves faster than we are right now. So this isn't, and the energy crisis is a symptom of, a, of the paradigm shift problem, not, not the solution we're looking for. And uh, so with that, just to get us a little bit depressed before we start, let me share a screen and off we go. Is that working? Let me make it a little bigger. How's that? Looking good. Okay, good. I'm very proud of my pretty blue slides, so I'll make sure they're working. <laughs> these, uh, these are, by the way, are extracted from the course that I'm teaching on regenerative economics, which I'll share with you a little bit before. Again, here's my way of just summarizing that we're in this moment of of crisis. It feels like an apocalypse to many, and I don't need to reiterate all of the symptoms of that. One might even suggest that the war in the Ukraine is a symptom of this crisis moment they're in. That'd be a little bit harder to prove, perhaps, but that's how I actually think about it. In fact, there is some cosmologists that I'm learning from that even suggest the earthquakes that we're experiencing are part of it because everything is connected to everything, but that's a bigger stretch. But just as a grounding, here's how I see reality. And this is not just an opinion, this is the latest science. We are a part of nature, we're not apart from nature. And that, of course, that idea is as old as our indigenous wisdom, but increasingly Living system scientists, cosmologists, biologists understand that Gaia is a living system and we're embedded in Gaia. Humanity is not apart from Gaia. And despite all of its achievements, our extractive economic system is an entropy accelerant. And again, most people on Wall Street, if they know what entropy means, they wouldn't connect its relevance to economics, much less finance. But entropy is the second law of thermodynamics. It's not a theory, it's a law. And, and our economic system is absolutely an accelerant of entropy, and that's not a good thing. We want to counter entropy in order to stay living and thriving. And the third point, and this is, this is an idea that actually Bucky Fuller first mentioned, it's we're living at a moment like a chick in an egg. And we've just bumped into the boundaries of the egg where we can extract the yolk for our nutrition as unlimited manner. And we have to break out of the egg and actually live as part of the real world, as opposed to being embedded in this unnatural egg where all of our needs are taken care of and we can do whatever we want. And so it's really a profound moment in history. And uh, it took me a while to get comfortable to both believe that, but then also say it. But I do think that 
despite the challenges of this moment in history, it is a it is a, an incredibly important and historic moment that future historians will look back at and call something. It'll have a name. And uh, so it, it's a privilege and a responsibility to live at this moment, but that doesn't mean it's going to be easy. And we've already talked about the, the notion of economic growth. I think it's important to just reiterate that we've essentially turned economic growth into our church. It's our belief system. And, uh, and this is true regardless of political ideology. This is not about conservative versus liberal politics or socialism versus capitalism. All of those economic systems or beliefs or policy with associated policies are predicated on exponential economic growth. And our whole tax system, our retirement system, the whole system is leveraged to economic growth. So the notion of degrowth, which is a popular response to this, or not popular, but a growing one, is filled with challenges that are, that are not trivial, to say the least. And, uh, and those are beyond our simple desire to have more stuff and more goods. It's a society as we've organized it would collapse if we had, if we systematically imposed negative growth over a period of years, which is all you need to do is watch and see what happens when we have a tiny little speck of a recession and you can see what would happen. Um, of course, economic growth, the guy who invented GNP measures warned us that the welfare of a nation can't be inferred from the measure of economic growth. And Kenneth Boulding said it, I think, back in the 1970s. Kenneth Boulding was one of the early system scientists. And... Uh, I love his expression, and anyone who believes in exponential growth forever on a finite world is either a madman or an economist. Now, in the course that I teach, I go back and trace the history of this, what I call fatal flaw in our economics, the theory of economics. It goes back to the scientific revolution and a moment when economists, in a sense, had physics envy. So Newton was making himself famous and popular, genius, discovery of the laws of uh, physics, at least the original, more simplistic laws. And uh, literally, there were a group of economists in the UK and in France who assumed that there had to be similar laws of economics to the laws of physics. And that's an interesting story, too long of a story for this talk. But a second thing happened right around the same time. And interestingly, the Mystic Massacre, Mystic, Connecticut is about five miles from where I'm sitting. So I didn't know this when I moved here, but I happened to be living in ground zero for the, the, uh, the genocide of the indigenous people in North America. And of course, the indigenous people around the world held a different worldview that is exactly the wisdom that we need at this moment. So we, we had the development of the scientific revolution and the destruction of indigenous culture and our respect for it happening right at the same time at the, big, at the beginning of the modern age. And just as a quick sort of, just to prove my point, this is a page out of the seminal textbook of Irving Fisher who was one of the founders of neoclassical economics. And he maps in, in very clear terms his assumption about taking ideas from, he calls it in mechanics, but that means Newtonian physics. A particle in Newtonian physics corresponds to an individual in economics. That was an assumption. That is the premise of neoclassical economics. And interestingly also, work corresponds to disutility. So the goal of economics is to maximize leisure and minimize work in the original theoretical foundation. And there have been patches to neoclassical economics over the years, but they've never gone back and essentially upgraded neoclassical economics to recognize and, and the advances of quantum physics, for example, much less our understanding of how life works, living systems work. And here's one like grotesque example of one of the patches. 
believe it or not, in 19, in 2018, William Nordhaus, who's a, the leader of, one of the leaders of this field of environmental economics, which is essentially the idea of putting prices on externalities and integrating them back into the neoclassical framework, he wrote, he developed a model that, that essentially said that three and a half degrees Celsius warming is our op op optimal goal because any lower goal would cost too much. That's literally a true statement. And he won the Nobel Prize for that. So it gives you an idea of how lost the economics profession is, which doesn't mean that economists are bad people, but they're a bit trapped, in my opinion, in Plato's cave. They don't see, they're disconnected from the reality of the planet and the living systems that we're embedded in. And of course, inequality and the planetary boundaries we've talked about climate change but if i don't know if thomas you guys got into this but here's another must understand framework by the uh, initially put out by the stockholm institute that is now well understood and trafficked including at the world Ec economic forum it's the ecological boundary roadmap that we're navigating and they define nine boundaries and the uh, the carbon cycle is one of those nine and uh, biosphere integrity relates to this species extinction but the point is that exponential growth on a finite planet doesn't meet doesn't work and we can now measure how we're breaching these boundaries in nine different categories and uh, and those, again, are symptoms of this, of this system design flaw. Those, aren't, those, aren't, those are problems, but those aren't simply problems we need to solve. Those are symptoms of the underlying system design. And if, if we simply try to solve those problems, we'll create other problems that are likely to be bigger. And so this is the first kind of big idea of this regenerative paradigm, which is that it requires us to shift it doesn't mean that the reductionist method of the scientific revolution, right? So reducing what's complicated to small parts so that you can manage and understand them. That's the reductionist method, which is, it's essentially a description of the scientific method. And Wes Jackson really says it the best. He says, there's nothing wrong with the scientific method. So, don't, so long as we don't confuse the method with how the world really works. And holism is, is, in a sense, the, the, I don't know if it's the opposite, but it, it's the piece we need to shift into. We need to shift from purely reductionist thinking to holistic thinking. And I got introduced to this actually through a relationship I have with a man named Alan Savory, who practices holistic management on grasslands, believe it or not. And I invested with them. So I learned about this through an investment project and saw how holistic management on the world's grasslands could generate what I would call, Alan uses different language, but I would call regenerative potential, meaning the, the diversity, the, the ability to grow soil under the grasslands is the result of this symbiotic relationship between large herbivores moving in herds engaged in grazing on grasslands. And Many people don't know, but the grasslands, the soil under the grasslands, the natural grasslands in North America and Africa in particular, the soil under the grasslands are the second largest carbon sink on the planet after the oceans, more than the forests by many measurements. And, and yet we've systematically destroyed the grasslands because of a reductionist mindset where we have turned most of them into cornfields and soybean fields because they're very fertile. But in the process, we've destroyed that symbiotic relationship with animals. So we solved one problem. We, we wanted more food, but we created a much bigger problem. We have climate change because the natural carbon sinks are the most hopeful solution to the carbon cycle problem is to re reinvigorate the natural carbon sinks, the ocean, the forests, the grasslands, the peat, while we reduce our emissions. And that's a whole conversation we could have. But, the, but again, the big idea is to, is to understand that we, we live in a world of complexity 
not simply complicated. And to manage complexity, we need to think differently and think holistically. And we can have a long conversation about that. Quick examples of what's complicated and what's complex. A machine is complicated. A rocket ship is complicated. The computer we're looking at is complicated. We're really good at complicated. But complexity is our body, our family, our marriages, the United Nations, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. We're not so good at complex. And, and yet the world is complex. And so we need to learn how to, we don't even really need to learn how to manage complexity. We need to learn how to manage with complexity or dance with complexity. And so I and others now increasingly think that this moment, as I said earlier, is a bigger shift than the shift from the medieval era to the modern era. And I'll just, to be provocative, call it the regenerative era. I don't know what future historians will call it. Integral era is probably more accurate, but I don't think we get to the integral era unless we pass through the regenerative era and learn how to operate in alignment with this regenerative process. And regeneration is not just a word. It's actually a process, the actual process of how living systems work. Our bodies are regenerating right now, or we're not having this conversation. The planet is regenerating, has been for 4 billion years. And, and remarkably and astonishingly and, and fantastically, those same patterns and principles extend beyond this planet to the entire solar system, and in fact, to the entire universe, if one believes what the cosmologists are now believing, discovering, and understanding. We're undoubtedly a group that likes to be practical and not theoretical, but at this moment in time, I'm going to argue for theoretical, because when we, run the, when we run the world on a theory that is fatally flawed, we don't even see the consequences of, of that shortfall. And as Einstein said, theory actually limits what we're able to see. So if we look at something through a failed theory, we won't actually see it for what it is. So quick definition, a theory of economics would imply that we need to apply nature's laws and patterns of systemic health, self-organization, self-renewal, and regenerative vitality to the design of socioeconomic systems. So there's a lot in that, and we can unpack it maybe in, in our discussion, but a couple of points to make. One, regenerative economics is not a new name for sustainability. It's profoundly different than the sustainability paradigm. It's not a political philosophy, as I mentioned. My, my dream, my hope is that in the future, politicians on the left and the right will fight about how to create regenerative economies the way they right now fight about how to create an extractive growth economy. And there are attributes of conservative thinking and liberal thinking that align with the regenerative paradigm. It's not, it isn't actually a liberal response to the neoliberal economic problem. Although, if I'm honest, there are, there's more alignment with the more liberal perspective than conservative, but again, something maybe we can talk about. And finally, while agriculture is fundamental to a regenerative economy, meaning regenerative agriculture, because the ground zero where humans interact with the living system of the planet. This is not an idea about agriculture alone. It's profoundly, the, the big idea is that we need to extend what we understand from regenerative agriculture to the entire economy. So it's built on three premises. One, and again, this we could have a debate about or a discussion about, but the premise is that the human economy is a living system. The second premise, oops, out of order. The second premise is that there are patterns and principles that describe how all living systems that have sustained themselves in the real world work. That's actually more than a premise. That's true. There are system scientists that they might not agree on the exact language. These are not like laws of physics. They're more, they're patterns, they're, princi they're design principles. But the ones I'll share with you, I've had road tested by many legitimate ecologists and, uh, and biologists, and they're essentially sound. And of course, there's a, uh, there's a distinction between a living system and a dead system, and a living system is one that has sustained itself. So we're interested in the ones that are still living, 
not the ones that are, that are no longer here. And then the final premise, and perhaps the most important one, is that if our human economy is to be sustainable and thrive over the long run, it too will need to align with these same patterns and principles. And I would suggest that either that's true or someone needs to make the case that after 4 billion years of life on this or existence of, on this planet, these patterns and principles need to apply to everything from our bodies to the forest, to the rivers, to the entire planet, but somehow they don't need to apply to the human economy. And if someone wants to make that case, they can defend neoclassical economics. So a quick way to think about this regenerative idea in the context of, of everything we know is this wonderful diagram that Bill Reed, one of my teachers and colleagues, and also a guest lecturer in our course, has created and is shared now. This is the ground map for the regenerative paradigm in many ways. And just conventional means us. That's where we are today. And we have this degenerative mechanistic design, mechanistic again, using the reductionist approach to reductionist thinking. We think in terms of parts. And in contrast to that, over on the right, we need to think holistically and in terms of patterns instead of parts and relationships. That's natural design thinking. And the work around the sustainability movement over the last 25 years has largely been trying, recognizing we're over on the left, even if we don't use that language, and grudgingly, gradually trying to move us toward this center sustainability idea. But the power and the promise of the regenerative paradigm is that it is a whole new way of interacting with life on this planet. It's a process of living systems. And if we align with that process, the outcome will become sustainability. So you can't get, you can't climb Mount Sustainability incrementally, although we need to move incrementally away from the left. You can only get to sustainability as a result of this regenerative process. That's the kind of next big idea of the regenerative paradigm. And in, in this short talk, I won't have time to go through each of these eight principles, but I do, I've written about them extensively and we go through them. We spend two entire weeks talking about these eight principles in the course, but let's just quickly review them in right relationships. So in living systems, there's a symbiotic relationship between the different components of the system. So there's a symbiotic relationship between the organs in our body and the health of our body. And there's a symbiotic relationship between the earth and the moon and the earth, the moon and the sun. And so this is a pattern that repeats from the very micro all the way to the macro. Empowered participation is actually a description of living systems. It's not an ethical desire. So we talk about inclusive economy or inclusive capitalism. That's an ethical desire. And I support that. But that doesn't mean that everyone's going to agree to it. But the premise of regenerative economics is that if we're going to have a sustainable system, you can't ignore one of the core first principles, design principles. So empowered participation is, for example, our feet and our toes are empowered to participate in the circulation of oxygen. Now that's great for our feet and our toes as an ethical matter, but that's also essential for our holistic health. No circulation of blood in our feet and our toes, no walking, no manifesting potential. So that idea of empowered participation shifts the, the way we think about the inequality crisis, in my opinion. And, and there's science that shows that the health of the whole is dependent on the health of all of the components of the whole. Views wealth holistically, money does not equal wealth. Innovative, adoptive, responsive. This is innovation is one of the profound great attributes of our free enterprise system. But, it, but adaptive and responsive means responsive to the changing context. So we need innovation in specific areas uh, to adapt to the context. So we need innovation in our energy system. We don't need so much innovation in stupid apps to encourage us to consume more stuff. It seeks balance. Again, we could spend hours, days talking about this, but let me just mention one aspect, the balance between masculine and feminine is way out of whack in our patriotic patriarchy 
economic system. And so this isn't about checking the box on how many women are on the board of directors. This is about truly valuing feminine and masculine energy, analytical versus intuitive thinking, for example. Edge effect abundance and re relates to where different systems come together. So we're like where a river meets an ocean. Think about the transdisciplinary edges between different fields of knowledge. That's where the juice lies. That's where the potential lies. That's where danger lies. But we're really good at working in our verticals of expertise. We're less good at working across verticals. And that's where a lot of the opportunity lies. Honors community in place. Living systems exist in place. And our globalized economy has run roughshod over both community and place. And so the current move toward decentralization of or deglobalization is actually a natural response to the conflict of how the global economy has developed and is a very positive thing from my point of view. And then finally, robust circulation. Think about metabolism. A living system is a metabolism. And so the circular economy sits within this one principle, but it's not limited to circular economy. Robust circulation means not spoiling your nest. It means guaranteeing healthy input, healthy food. Austerity policies by governments, when a, when a, when a system is weak, if you put it on austerity and take its food away, it's going to die. Auster austerity thinking from a policy response is insanity if you're trying to create a healthy, robust circula circulatory system. And again, we could spend a lot more time on it. Now, I just want to quickly try to apply this to the investment world, since I know most of us are trying to work or trying to think about how this relates to finance and in investment in particular, and then we'll be done. Again, very quickly, and we can come back to this, but I've mapped these same, using the same Bill Reed diagram, but mapped the kind of the current quote, sustainability investment paradigms or practices against it. And as you can see, I would place over on, and by the way, this is just, this is rough, right? There's nothing, a lot, all this is a bit debatable, but conceptually, the, the extractive, violent activities of some activists, not all, but some activist hedge funds, purely for short-term speculative extraction is probably far on the left and far toward the bottom. The whole traditional LBO movement is essentially extracting value out of companies for financial profit. And that, but passive fund management, which is the dominant paradigm of, of modern capital markets. If you have no relationship with the enterprises that you invest in, you're in conflict with the first and fundamental principle of living systems, which is to work in right relationship. So passive index funds were again, a solution to a different problem that created an even bigger problem, which is the largest investors of the world now, in my opinion, I, can't, I wouldn't even call them investors. They show up in an annual meeting and vote a proxy, but they don't actually have an, a relationship with the enterprises they invest in. Now, how many people would say that the S&P 500 index fund is a bad thing? <clears throat> it's not a bad thing until it becomes the dominant paradigm, excuse me a sec, and suddenly we are trying to transform massive major global corporations, the biggest institutions that humanity has ever created. And there isn't even anyone to talk to because the boards of directors are agents for the management and there's no real direct accountability or responsibility on behalf of ownership. So passive ESG is incrementally better. Active ESG, of course, is better than that. In impact investment in green bonds, we're starting to get toward actually influencing the direction of the future economy. So I use those as on either side of the sustainability thing, but the sustainability pivot. But the future, in my opinion, and this is going to be really hard, and I have no pretense that this is about to happen, but to be a regenerative financial system and to do regenerative investment requires a stretch way out to the right that no one is even talking about yet. And I've written about this extensively in, in my book, which is online, Finance for a Regenerative World. And maybe we'll, I'll save and we'll talk about this when, we, when I get done. But the idea of investing solely 
to maximize risk adjusted return to my portfolio is not in keeping with a holistic approach to systemic health. And somehow we need to shift capital into alignment with investing in such a way that generates appropriate financial return, but essentially systemic returns as well. And given that the system is so horribly broken, that's a very tall task. Again, we come back to that when we have a discussion. Just a quick comment on the whole ESG thing. Again, we could spend the next hour talking about it. I just love this little chart that, that someone pointed out to me, which is that despite the rise of ESG, it's nicely correlated with the rise of carbon emissions. So clearly that's not a solution to the problem. And again, we can talk about what ESG is and isn't and the current political nonsense around it in the United States. But this is one thing I did want to share. This is my best way to articulate what I do with my own investment portfolio. And I, I, um, I gave up my day job, <laughs> my wife likes to remind me, 20 years ago. And so I live off of an investment portfolio while I do this work, by and large. And it, it's not excessive by any means. It's just barely enough. <laughs> but so it matters how I invest it for my, my family, my livelihood. But I, and I could go into, I could, I, when, in a longer conversation, I could share the details. I'm happy to share the details with it. But this is how I think about it. Doing my best to apply this thinking to an investment portfolio, which by the way, someone asked me in a talk, what if pension funds and sovereign wealth funds did this, would it matter? And initially I said, I had never thought of that. But in fact, if large institutional capital did this, it would, it would shift the economy in my opinion. And the first thing you need to do is throw away modern portfolio theory because modern portfolio theory is, is a backward looking theory of speculation more than anything else. It has nothing to do with the risks, the real risks that we're facing. And it's built on flawed statistics, nonetheless, in addition. So even if all you're interested in doing is speculating, you're, you would do well to throw away your modern portfolio theory, which is stunning because probably 90% of the capital on planet earth is managed implicitly or explicitly according to modern portfolio theory. What I recommend or try to do is first set constraints, liquidity constraints and return constraints. And I would suggest that if you're a billionaire or a sovereign wealth fund, you should have a different re return constraint than if you're John Fullerton. And if you're John Fullerton, you should have a different return constraint than if you're a working class person that's trying desperately to save enough money for retirement. But whatever that constraint is, it could be positive 10%, positive 20%, or negative 20%, or zero, or that's a decision one needs to make. It's, it shouldn't, we shouldn't just assume that it's maximize it at the expense of everything else. And then the objectives I look for, or I try to achieve, are first, I want to be responsible. So I have exited my oil and gas exposure years ago, just because I didn't feel it was responsible to be invested in that. Now, there's a whole debate we could have about whether that matters. I tend to agree it probably didn't matter, certainly at my scale. Critically, I want my investments to generate resilient cash flows. And that's in part based on my worldview, the, constant, the implications of the last three lectures that you've all had tells me that you want to own resilient cash flows. So renewable energy infrastructure is resilient cash flow. I own a lot of that as an example. And then finally, I look for projects that generate regenerative potential, systemic regenerative potential. And uh, I have a few of those. The grasslands example I talked about earlier is one. There's a fascinating, there's lots of examples we could share. Final comment just about this whole crypto stuff. The only thing I would say briefly is that the decentralized finance movement, Bitcoin and all of the rest that's just blown up is, um, is horribly misguided and is essentially replicating all of the flaws of the traditional financial system in a decentralized, unregulated way. But there's a huge promise of blockchain technology if we apply it 
into what is now being known as regenerative finance. And refi is a, or regenerative finance is a term I used in my book, but there's a bunch of techies now referring to refi and there's this really cool movement happening. There's over a hundred initiatives that I've heard of that are trying to use decentralized blockchain technology and <clears throat> create incentives and currencies that stimulate the type of activities that we want. For example, there's a lot around regenerative agriculture, which is the natural place for it to start. Last comment, a quick commercial for the course. Our next cohort begins in, in less than a month. Lots of information about it on my website, capitalinstitute.org. I love what Ted Manning of Patagonia said. He will never see the world nor his role in it the same way. That's the, the impact I hope we will achieve is to shift people's view. It doesn't mean that I've sent Ted back to Patagonia with a checklist of stuff to do to fix Patagonia or make it better than it is. It means that all of the challenges that they are facing and the ambition that they have, they will see it in a different way. And that's my hope for everyone who participates in the course. And by the way, just in case you think this is a new idea, it's not. It's as old as Bucky Fuller and it's actually as old as the Christian mystics and our indigenous forefathers. But in Bucky's last book and his sort of sign off to humanity, it stunned me. I read this in about 2019, long after I had been on this track. He wrote that nature is a totally efficient, self-regenerating system. And if we discover the laws that govern the system, which I would suggest we have done now, we the scientists, and live synergistically within them, sustainability will follow and humanity will be a success. And if you read that last book, it's called Grunge. It's very clear that he also, what he also was warning is that if we don't do that, humanity is in trouble.